I'd start the show a little differently and introduce myself. I am your host, Richard Dugan. This is Tell Me Your Story, and you are listening to New Paradigms for a New World as we give you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. I really enjoy bringing these programs to you uh, and uh, taking the opportunity to talk with our guests about a wide variety of subjects that I am so excited about and Today is no exception. Today we are bringing back a, a guest who we've had on before uh, from, we'll call it the Jungian perspective, from Jungian psychology, uh, Thomas uh, uh, um, Elsner. Thomas Elsner is uh, a Jungian psychologist and he is here to help us to uh, better understand ourselves and the world in which we live. Hey, Thomas, thanks so much for joining us. It's great to have you back on the program. And by the way, you're local right here on the South Coast, which is great. One of these days, we'll have you in studio to do one of these programs. I, I could come in, absolutely. I'm in Goleta, so I could come right down in first. But great to be here. Thank you, Richard. Good to be back. I'm looking forward to it. You know, uh, I often joke about how, you know, when I have somebody on who is <clears throat> of, a, of a particular... Uh, psychiatric or psychological persuasion. I'm thinking, okay, are they gonna, are they gonna process me during the interview and maybe give me a little analysis at the end? You know, well, Richard, you're this and you're that and you're the other. Uh, and you know what? Uh, I wouldn't mind that so much, but it never happens. So uh, probably. Not. <laughs> However, we are gonna, we are gonna take a look at our society, our world, our civilization, our uh, nation, our state, our community in which we live. And yes, it's going to be a little bit on uh, the era in which we live. I like to, I like to use the term, uh, Thomas, uh, the COVID era, uh, because they never last. They don't. I mean, uh, I don't, I heard it said that the longest lasting civilization and I don't know which one it was, was roughly, and this is probably incorrect because I've heard others that are even longer, 400 years. But I've heard of some that maybe lasted a thousand or more. I, I, you know, I don't, I, I haven't dove, uh, dove? Anyway, I haven't uh, endeavored to research all of that to find out which civilizations uh, have been around the longest. But most, if not all of them, from the beginning of man's existence on this planet aren't here anymore mm -hmm. gone, and we're here and and you know people think that for example and i'm sure this is probably the case in pretty much any country on the planet they think that their uh way of life is going to be around forever mm -hmm. And even our way of life in this country isn't what it was with the founders. Uh, I don't know if I shared this with you the last time, but I had a guest on who wrote a book about, you know, uh, finding a, 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 a rational form of government to which my very first question was, when was the last time we had a rational form of government? He says, it's about uh, three to four minutes after the ink dried on the Constitution. <laughs> That's a great answer. You yeah. Know? And and yes. so and it's been changing ever since. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, our perceptions. And and by the way, uh, another one of my guests made the comment about the, our future and how you know you, where we are today. You and I, all of the choices that we have made have brought us to this moment together, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All, all mm -hmm. of the choices we will make will put us wherever it is we're going to be down the road. But one of my guests made the wonderful observation. He says, actually, your perception of the future will determine the choices that you make now. And I thought, wow, I, I hadn't actually thought of it that way. But that's true. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about a little bit about our perceptions and maybe our, our, our ancestors' perceptions of what they thought the future would be. Uh, by comparison to where we are and where we might be in 50 or 100 years or a thousand if we're even still here if we don't annihilate ourselves uh, and so forth uh, I, I know it's it's a huge place to start but it seems to me that if we don't take a look a little bit at that whole process uh, you know we're kind of missing out a little bit well yeah that's a huge place to start thanks for the intro 
I'm tracking everything you said. There was a big download of information. I loved all of it. <laughs> but, you know, just to, just to start a little bit with the, yeah, some civilizations, as far as my understanding goes, have lasted quite a long time. I mean, for instance, the ancient Egyptian civilization lasted for thousands of years. Okay. And they seem to have discovered the secret of what they called eternal renewal, death and rebirth, mm. as the secret of how things can change, die, but be reborn um, in a stable way. So their myth, the Egyptian myth, was the myth of the sun. They saw the sun go down every night. Every night it died in the West. Mm -hmm. And then they imagined it traveled through the underworld. The sun god on his ship traveled through the seas of the underworld where he encountered 12 hours of the night, dangerous enemies, threats, crises, before he was eventually reborn in the East as the reborn sun. You might have seen from the King Tut exhibit, the scarab that brings up the newborn sun out of the East. That was, this is one of the most ancient myths that we have in terms of how human beings perceive the future and perceive their role vis-a-vis -vis time. Death and renewal, death and rebirth. Everything dies, everything changes, everything's reborn. If you're close to nature, you know that, right? If you crush a tomato outside on the ground where I'm looking outside my window now, the seeds go down into the earth, they may come up as a new plant. If you crush a tomato on the parking lot, the seeds just, nothing happens, right? So if we're closer to the natural cycles of things, we have more of a sense of death and rebirth. We've lost that a lot in our culture. This may be a jumping off point to how our culture wants to uh, perceive the future. Brilliant point about one, when did we have a rational form of government two, two minutes after the <laughs> constitution was signed? Yeah, because human beings, like our neocortex is this thin little layer of the brain. Much more of our bodies are not logic, not rational. And, um, then how we perceive ourselves now, our fantasies, our imagination of ourselves, our myths, so to speak. Myths not understood as lies or delusions, but as the ways that human beings have of perceiving things, conceiving of things, the way we see the world, you know, determines what we do and that determines how things work out. So that's my response back to your opening and maybe we can take it from there, see okay. where you want to go, yeah. Well, it's it's and and I, I what is fascinating is this concept of myth, the mythology. Did a series several years ago, actually seven years ago, on uh, Mythosophia was the title of the Tell Me Your Story series, twelve part series, uh, one a month, uh, where we delved delved uh, dove into the uh, uh, Mythosophia was uh, exploring the depths of myth and wisdom. And it was a fascinating series. And when it was all over, I realized 12 ain't enough because there are, I, I, matter of fact, as we got close to the end of the series, I was watching, of course, some of these uh, news stories about Christmas and especially the, the uh, uh, Christmas Eve ceasefire during World War I. Mm -hmm. And the mythology that has come about because there was so little information about exactly what happened. I mean, certainly there was enough evidence, uh, they say, to show that the uh, two battling sides stopped their fighting at, on Christmas Eve. They actually joined together and had a meal together. Mm. Well, now here's where the myth starts in, that they supposedly played a game of soccer. But we don't know who won. And maybe on one level you know it doesn't matter who won because there they were they found a way to transcend that warlike energy and mentality to get into their humanity and maybe the i don't know if you want to say the christmas spirit if you will which you know we'll, we'll call it that and uh, for a brief, I don't know, who knows how long, 12 hours, 14, 16, yeah. you know, we don't know. But again, this is where the myth starts to take off. And I thought, wow, I never even thought about war mythology or mythology of war and military events and so forth. And I know that, and I've met quite a number of veterans here in the States. They, first of all, they don't like talking about what they went through okay so they're not about to embellish they're not going to exaggerate however there are some people for example <clears throat> i was uh, i was born in 1960 
I was at Woodstock. Mm-hmm. I wasn't. Okay. But you can't prove that I wasn't there. Of course, I can't prove I was, but, you know, the, the, and, 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 you know, you'll hear people who will talk about certain significant events, sporting events or political events or what have you, and they'll say, oh, yeah, I was there, you know, and I, really, okay, uh, and they weren't. They will embellish, they will fabricate, and then the myth begins. Mm-hmm. So they're all, and, and I think that that aspect of myth, there's always a kernel of truth or fact within these myths uh that again the myth is nothing more than the truth being embellished we honestly uh if we choose to believe what we've seen okay during of uh, of the last administration and we aren't going to get political here we have photographic evidence of the population that occupied the uh, Capitol Rotunda or the, the square, I, for, I forget the name of the place where they hold the inauguration. We can see with photographic evidence the realities of how many people attended that inauguration versus the one prior and the one prior to that. And there weren't that many people there. Okay, and yet we keep hearing stories about how there were more people there than at any other inauguration in the history of this country. And I'm going, okay, then you must be using the new math that says two plus two is, Tom, let's discuss what two plus two is, because I don't believe it's four. Uh, It's the new math. (laughs) Right. Right. So this is how myths are built and then of course you have the mythology of the greeks and the romans and the egyptians and many many other cultures we've got a lot of myths about our history and only over the last what maybe decade or two maybe more we've started to be introduced to some of the facts the realities of what really happened christopher columbus for example during the 500th anniversary in 1992, I started hearing three different versions of who this guy was. He went from an angel to a devil and then somewhere in the middle, you know? And I think mm-hmm. somewhere in the middle is probably more accurate. Mm-hmm. And yet there are people mm-hmm. who just refuse to accept, you know, the one extreme over the other and vice versa. Um, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about how these myths actually tend to propel uh, a people, uh, even an individual. I would venture that uh, you might uh, be telling a story to your family and your siblings, your parents. You know, I I did, and and you were living at home and you're telling the story about how when you were at home with the other siblings, the parents, you did this, that, and the other thing, and they're going to go, you know, Tom, I don't really remember it that way let me tell you what i remember Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how this Mm -hmm. shapes our our present day fantastic this is great um yes i do experience this all the time in my personal life the the confluence of imagination and reality and the impossibility of ever completely separating one from the other we never see reality as it is ever we we always see reality through our eyes we hear it through our ears we experience it through our sense or our tactile sensory organs we see reality through our assumptions our history our anticipations our wounds our defenses against being rewounded our traumas the world soaked in imagination our values and what another word for that is myth So Joseph Campbell said, for instance, myth is another person's religion. (laughs) So if you are calling something a myth, it means you're already not identified with it. You don't really believe it as truth. Mm -hmm. If you are contained in a myth in the way that I'm using the word, you don't see it as myth. You see it as truth. And you see it as real values. You see it as values that you are not willing to only die for, but maybe even to kill for. That's how sacred mythologies are, how vividly and vitally important imagination is. 
um, and how much it soaks our world all the time. So if you think of politics and religion, those are two places where we project our myths, mm. our highest values, our worst fears. You know, that's why you never talk about politics or religion at polite dinner conversations. <laughs> you don't bring it up either mm. because people get emotional. Like it's not just rational. And if you think of our political structures, just for a second, we've got two parties, right and left. Those are the words we call the parties, right and left. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? That's a myth. There's a left hand, there's a right hand. <laughs> there's a split. Yeah. There's a way, way of seeing things as a duality. Now, um, we can, uh, we're, where we can go from here, I'll just, I just want to say, um, I can share with you a dream I had after 9-11 that shows the way that the unconscious psyche and my experience of it expresses a myth of what we can do about the problem of war. You know, what can we do about that problem? Um, a mythological symbolic answer to that. Um, and then we, can, we could also talk more about mythologies and politics. For instance, Martin Luther King in his last book, Chaos or Community said that America, for its very survival sake, is going to have to give birth to new values. You know, the myths, that, yeah. Let's yeah. do that as we continue here on Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm here with Thomas Elsner. He's a Jungian psychologist, and we're with him here today to talk. As uh, you are already hearing, uh, we're diving into this concept of mythology as it relates to uh, how our civilization moves forward. I'm not going to say progresses. <laughs> because that's that's a giant leap that I don't think we can make just yet. We maybe by the end of the program we might, but nonetheless, we hope you'll stay with us here on Tell Me Your Story. Uh, Thomas Alsner, uh, dot org is the website. We are linked to his website by virtue of our first interview, and we will continue to stay linked to his website here on Tell Me Your Story. We're bringing you. New paradigms for a new world here on the program as we give you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. And you, uh, Thomas Elsner, were talking about a dream that you had shortly after 9-11 that sort of, um, I guess, makes the point about maybe some of the choices that you made from that point from that dream forward, even if those choices were nothing more than internal mental uh, choices, maybe not physical, you didn't, you know, choose to move away from this place or that place or change your whole lifestyle, but you made some even internal uh, adjustments. That's a great way to put it, Richard. Yeah, that's true. So 20 years ago, almost exactly now, right? 20 years ago, 9-11, I was in Switzerland when I was, where I was training as a Jungian analyst out there. And we were in this beautiful place in the Alps. It was actually a convent that was also a conference center. So, you know, in the Alps, in this extremely peaceful place, nuns floating about, very introverted. We're studying Jungian psychology. Everything's tranquil, right? And I remember one of my teachers walking down the steps, a Swiss woman, as I was walking up, and she had just heard about the Twin Towers and <clears throat> what had happened and her whole face was shaken because she knew I was an American, right? So she told me what had happened. And of course we were all glued to the TV set. I had the feeling, oh my God, the world as I know it is coming to an end. Like, is there gonna be an outbreak of war, complete war? What's gonna happen? And I was really um, uh, wrestling with the question, what can I do about this, about the problem of war? about this psychotic insanity that's, you know, on both sides, not just one, there's the problem of war takes two people. And then about 10 days after that, I had a dream. It was one of the most vivid, scary, challenging and powerful dreams of my life. And I'll just share with you the short version of it. Um, it starts off that I'm uh, at a place outdoors where I'm gonna give a lecture to a group of men, which is something I would typically do, like I would teach give lectures, it's my typical sort of life thing that I would do that. Um, and then in the group of men, there's an Afghan man and there's an American man, and they start to fight. It's, it's, it's similar to your World War I story. Here are the opposites fighting. And in the dream, I know the Afghan man has half the truth, 
and the American man has half the truth. So I decide I'm going to mediate that fight that they're in. So this is the second solution I have is I am going to mediate for them through communication or, you know, get them to be able to relate to each other. You know, it's a very now naive, innocent, idealistic way to, to, to try to solve this problem. Um, then the dream steps in and says what the short version of the dream is what I have to do if I want to make a contribution to the problem of war, the problem of the battling opposites here is I have to go through this ritual. And the ritual was dark and, and frightening. It was a little like the Catholic mass, but in a dark way. And in the dream, I had to take an iron blade, cut my own right hand, put the blood into a vessel and drink my own blood. And that was the mythopoetic symbol of how I could help with the problem of war. Drink my own blood in a, in a, in a ritual. You know, mm -hmm. and it was so frightening that I could go through with the first part and it was too scary, too weird, too frightening at the time for me to go through with integrating my own blood once I extracted it from my body. Um, so I was shaken by that dream. And, and I remember the next day I was telling one of my teachers out in Switzerland the dream and I could barely sort of talk and it was very disturbing to me. Now in the 20 years since I've worked with it, the bottom line is that this is a dream about dealing with one's own shadow. You know, how can I make a contribution to the problem of war? I can extract, become aware of, and then reintegrate my own fiery blood, my own psychosomatic reality that, as Jung mentioned, is typically projected onto enemies outside. So this is what we typically do. We, re we reject certain parts of ourselves that are disturbing, violent, aggressive, wounded, and we project those out. That's called shadow projection onto enemies outside and we fight them. The distinction to that, the dream is saying, extract and integrate your own substance, you know? Mm. Um, so this is a way in which the, the myth can make a contribution to society. Where can we go from here? Especially when our consciousness doesn't know. I mean, it's the typical, um, fate of the hero in fairy tales and myths to come across the impossible problem, right? You can marry the princess if you dive to the bottom of the sea and get the gold ring out of the fish at the bottom of the ocean, right? No, I can't do it. There's always an impossible problem. And then we have to rely on helpful forces that aren't the ego, they're not, not conscious. Um, and this is where we find ourselves today, right? I mean, obviously, problems of global warming, problems of war, terrorism, economic collapse, all the stuff that we all feel as apocalyptic now, who knows how to solve it? Nobody knows how to solve it. So one solution from Jungian psychology is when we don't know the answer, look to our dreams, look to what the unconscious says. Where else could an answer be except in the unconscious? We don't know it. And the unconscious speaks in this mythic way it doesn't speak in a literal, factual way. It speaks in a symbolic way. So we also have to develop a mythic awareness or a symbolic way of understanding things to be able to relate to the unconscious. That would be a way to say, how can we go into the future? You know, when we don't know how, how can we go forward into the future? I've even put forth a question. I've stopped asking it because it's kind of a negative kind of question, but still I would ask it mm -hmm. uh, because I was always curious about the response. And the question is, do you honestly believe that humanity deserves to continue because of the way we've treated our home and each other, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, then I think about, and this is the reason why I don't ask a question anymore, then I think about the reasons why we get educated. The reasons why we do have prisons that incarcerate people for a period of time, and things are starting to shift a little in terms of recidivism. 
uh, that, you know, and then, of course, the same thing with uh, with our military, our veterans. Uh, you know, it isn't so much the veterans that need to change. It's us that need to change to accepting them, regardless of what what conflict they were uh, involved in. Um, but it, but it's 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 like even in our religions, there is this concept called forgiveness. That doesn't mean that we forget. All right. You you did this thing. All right. That's a reality. We have the evidence that shows you did it. OK, but. We put you in this place for a period of time as we saw fit uh, so that you could. Uh, it's kind of like putting the ch you go to your room and you think about what you've done yeah. the next 10 years. Yeah. All right. <laughs> And hopefully when you come out, you'll have a better understanding and know that that is not appropriate behavior in our society. Unfortunately, for many, nothing really happens in there other than they actually take on other skills and abilities that are even, as, even more antisocial. But again, as I say, that is starting to change. Uh, recidivism rates, I don't know if they're going up or down. All I know is that there has to come a point at which we forgive not just others but ourselves now somebody challenged me the other day about my quote unquote mistakes now this mm -hmm. may go against the grain for some but this is mm -hmm. where i'm at today and again this is for me i'm not putting this on anybody else they said, uh, you know, well, yeah, well, look at all the mistakes you've made. I said, I haven't made no mistakes in my life. None. What I have had, what you call mistakes, I call them learning experiences. I have learned from those quote unquote mistakes. Um, obviously, the religious community, especially the Christian community, would have a hard time with that because they would say, no, you're a sinner. You know, you're a sinner. You have you have original sin. Like, no, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, that's you know. Uh, the, even the Old Testament says that the sins of the father are, are are passed down to the sons to seven generations. Well, I believe between Adam and me there are a few more than seven generations. But without going into the the doctrine and dogma, mm -hmm. forgiveness. Can we? Uh, and I'm curious how that plays into Jungian psychology and your, uh, your train of thought and your training and the way in which you work with people. And I think what you, you facilitate an individual's healing. You don't heal anybody. You don't bring anybody back from the abyss, shall we say. Uh, you facilitate them bringing themselves back from the abyss. Is that fair? That's absolutely fair. <clears throat> absolutely correct. So I want to extract a couple things you said. One is relating to our prior conversation about myths. Mm -hmm. um, and the second, I'll, t I'll talk about healing. And, you know, in my experience personally and in, in my work as a psychotherapist, um, for that's a myth. Good and evil, that's a myth. Sin, that's a myth. The, these, are, these are not facts. These are ideas. This is imagination. You know, we don't see things that way typically. If we, we need to take a step back. The myth of good and evil, you know, is described in the Garden of Eden. At one point, there was no knowledge of good and evil. Then, you know, Eve was tempted by the serpent, ate from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and their eyes were awoke, opened and they saw themselves in a different way. So good and evil is a very fundamental myth in Western culture. Some people are good, some people are evil. Of course, we want to be the good ones. What happens to the evil then? It's projected, right? Um, forgiveness is a way to deal with this problem of splitting good and evil. Evil. If we relate this to politics, right? You can see the mythology more clearly maybe in politics this way. The right wing emphasizes punishment, borders, divisions right the left wing emphasizes forgiveness compassion mercy equality these are competing myths that can 
take not just religious but political forms and it'd be as emotionally charged as any religion right mm -hmm. so now personally speaking yeah that this is my myth is forgiveness absolutely i mean the other day i was talking to my 16 year old in the kitchen when he was in junior high he went through a whole lot of mistakes which i won't describe publicly but a whole lot of mistakes mm -hmm. right and he felt guilty about them and he felt bad about them and yesterday in the kitchen i was saying man, there's no mistake it's not mistakes you learn from this you grew from all of that this is another way to view or imagine facts rather than sin punishment guilt bad stop that it's uh you live through something real that belongs to your personality and grew from it and he really did so um yeah, my myth is forgiveness. As a psychotherapist, <clears throat> I mean, it's understanding in depth without judgment that produces healing in my experience, you know. Tom Elsner, Thomas Elsner, uh, Jungian psychologist, is with us here today here on Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World as we uh, continue our conversation uh, with him. And you are able to uh, listen to these programs uh, at uh, 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. on Sundays, 1 a.m. Monday mornings, and 9 a.m. for a special edition, 9 a.m. on Wednesdays. We stream those programs live at richarddugan.com. And the podcasts are on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn, Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, and many other locations. And we're so glad that you folks are reposting them. I hope you'll subscribe to them as well. And we're on YouTube, where you can go to Richard Dugan and tell me your story. Now, I found another channel called Tell Me Your Story on YouTube, but it's not mine. Uh, mine is this one. And it's with this hat. Just look for the guy with the hat, and you will be right where you need to be. I'm your host, Richard Dugan, along with Tom Elsner, and he is a Jungian psychologist, and we are talking, I think, about some very profound things that we need to be discussing in this particular era, in this particular period of our lives and uh, time in our history, if you will. Uh, I have to say, <laughs> Tom, <laughs> speaking of myths, I love the phrase I hear quite often, especially in historically oriented documentaries, where they will be talking about a particular event, and then there's a certain thing that happens during that event, and then the phrase comes out, which changed the course of history. Mm. And I'm, <clears throat> so you knew the direction that history was going to take. <laughs> you, yeah, you, good you point. Had a psychic with somebody <laughs> that could see which direction it was going, and then when this thing happened, it changed everything. It's like. Please give me a break. Um, but again, we have a lot of these phrases that that pop up that continue to perpetuate those myths. We were talking in the last uh, segment about um, forgiveness and uh, and the mythology surrounding that as well. I have to say that uh, one of the things that I find interesting uh, that I struggled with for quite some time, and I, I have less, much less a struggle with it. I was probably up around a, a nine or a 10, but I'm probably down closer to a one or a two. Having to do with dualism, all right? Mm. Left and right, good and evil, as you were referring to uh, earlier. And uh, I've come to the conclusion that as the Hindus uh, say, it's all Maya. Or as Lewis Black would say, it's all an illusion. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> uh, because I use that analogy of the macro uh, uh, cosmos, uh, uh, the macro world, if you will, and the micro world, and then the middle, which is where we live. And when we take a look at the cosmos out in the universe, uh, we uh, uh, are in awe of whatever's happening. It doesn't matter. It could be a supernova just exploded. Uh, maybe a comet crashed into a, an asteroid or a planet, and we're watching that. Uh, we're yeah. watching stuff flying everywhere. We're looking at the asteroid belt that is, I, don't, I guess it's around uh, the outer edges of our solar system in particular. Mm. Uh, we see all of these things. We see the solar flares of our star we call the sun. Then you go to the micro world, 
and you're looking through, let's say, an electron telescope, a uh, mi micro <laughs> electron microscope. Right. <clears throat> but who knows? And you're seeing basically the same thing. All right. You're seeing things divide. You're seeing things unite and merge. You're seeing things crashing in and this and you're seeing some things eating other things like Pac-Man, you know, and we're we're just wow. Oh, man, that's why, you know, we're in awe. All right. There's no real plus or minus. It's not a positive or negative response. It's just wow. When we start looking at our world here where we live. There is no wow. It's ah, or ah. And I thought, wait a minute. Why are we passing judgment here when we're not passing judgment there or there? You know, mm -hmm. um, it's mm -hmm. just, uh, it's it's very interesting. So I I put all of this into context, and I said, there's no dualism. Uh, I, I, I have to say that one of the things that frustrated me was uh, the ancient wisdom teachings from a, a, a lot of the philosophies that are out there speak of where we come from, the mm -hmm. one. And they speak of where we're going to, the one. Mm -hmm. And my question is then, why are we here in this dualistic world? Mm -hmm. Because that's how we perceive it, mm -hmm. dualistic. Yes. And yeah. so we have a lot of what we call evidence of its dualism with sunrises and sunsets. Mm -hmm. and, night. And, and we could list more. But the reality is those are just cycles. That's just what happens. It's, it basically is what is. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll, I'll even bring your son and his experiences into the mix. Your son, you, and I are perfect. We are perfect. Now, why do I say that? And let's talk a little bit about this concept mm -hmm. of perfection. Mm -hmm. The New Testament <clears throat> speaks in the Gospels. There's the, the passage that reads, I paraphrase it, Be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. What does that word perfect in that context mean? So I did some research. It means just to be. No dualism there. No left, right, right, wrong, just to be. And that's perfection because God is not dualistic. Even though there will be those who say, oh, you're talking about an Old Testament God that's going to do this, that, and the other thing, as opposed to the New Testament God who is not going to do those things. It's the law of love. Well, yeah. that's a wonderful thing, but God isn't dualistic. God just is. So let's talk about this concept mm -hmm. of perfection from the to be. I won't quote Shakespeare here. It's, I opened myself wide open for that. Uh, as opposed to the perfection of the, the, the dualistic perfection. And how, how, how it seems to me that kind of screws us up a little bit, doesn't it? Uh, well, yes, I agree. It and I agree with you because I share the same myth as you do. Richard, every, your beautiful download there that covered so much territory is an expression of the myth of your life, really. And it's, it's um, a myth that one does not find in either traditional Christianity or, to tell you the truth, the age of the European Enlightenment with Cartesian dualism and the development of the rational faculty to look at nature quantitatively factually and literally as as and banish imagination or soul from nature so both of those major major myths in our western culture today the judeo-christian and the enlightenment age of reason scientific revolution you, your myth is not either of those so and you can feel like looking into the skies that's where the numinous is for you in nature yeah it's awesome. It's 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 what we would feel like if a believing Christian went into a church and sees the cross. It's the same emotional reaction now. It's like a natural supernaturalism and peering in with the telescope into the inner world or the microphysical world and being awestruck by the mysteries that one sees there that scientists see there. You know, this this is this is I would say the myth of our 
times now is a myth of the unification of what's been split by Judeo-Christianity and by contemporary science. You can see a movement and not just you, many people being awestruck by this idea of unity, by the, uh, the, the, the numinous in nature and the, the necessity to not split good and evil, inner and outer, nature and spirit that doesn't make sense to you it doesn't right this because there's a myth in the collective psyche that you're part of and it's trying to unify what's been split in our culture so that's that's how i want to first respond to everything you said is that's what i mean by a myth everything you said is a myth and that doesn't mean it's a lie that doesn't mean it's a delusion it means it's the development and evolution of human consciousness this is what it looks like now <laughs> <laughs> when we, and matter of fact, when you take a look at nature uh, at our level, okay, and you compare it to the micro world or the macro world, uh, we label what we see on the Serengeti plain as predator and prey. Yes, we label it that way. Yes. Why isn't it predator and prey when a cancer cell uh, takes uh, one of your red blood cells and consumes it. I, and I'm, I don't know if that's true, but, it's, it, but it's like, you don't call that predator and prey. It's just a process. Well, it's just a process at this level on the Serengeti plane. That is life. That is the way it works. And uh, nothing is ever lost. Uh, what uh, somebody shared with me not long ago about, um, how uh, uh, energy, everything is energy. Mm -hmm. You can't destroy energy. It is only transformed into something else. And a lot of times we, the emotional creature that we are, we are emotionally moved when we see the gazelle being consumed by the, uh, 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 I'm not even sure what the, if it's a herd of jackals or lions or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's just, mm -hmm. that's just life. And mm -hmm. uh, let's be thankful, A, that we got to see the gazelle run, but how marvelous to see the process of life unfolding right before our eyes and transforming energy from one creature, if you will, to the next. Yeah. Yes, beautiful. Yeah, Bla William Blake, the British romantic poet, said everything that lives is holy. You know, this is, you can find this in, in the poets too. It's essentially, in terms of myth, what you're describing, a, a, a maternal myth, a myth of the great mother, a great myth of nature that has cycles, death, rebirth, you know, cycles of renewal transformations it's circular, circular this mythology it's not a myth of progress it's not a myth of leaving the earth behind it's not a myth of leaving the body behind it's a myth of that predator prey and nothing everything is um in a cycle of death and renewal all the time <laughs> that's a maternal myth of the great mother it's the feminine mythology more than the masculine hero myth the masculine hero wants to overcome the dragon, mm. but right? Always wants to overcome death, always wants to overcome imperfection, always wants to go progress in this a straight up line, you know, towards the future. What you're describing is something very different. And it's, um, it is imagination. You are imagining the world in a different way than the hero myth imagines the world. Mm. Well, I tell you, I'm, I'm, uh, thrilled and excited about the, as, uh, the the ability to be able to imagine. I, 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 I know that there is a whole segment of our society here in this country in particular that absolutely abhors the, the lyrics of the song Imagine by John Lennon. Um, and I'm sitting here going, well, but who said that this was the only way to live? Who said this was the only way to love? Who said this was the only way to, if we choose to use this word, to worship or to serve our creator? Yeah. Who said this was the only way to uh, exchange energies, uh, capitalism and free enterprise? And I'm not criticizing, uh, I'm not going either way on that. I'm just saying 
that we came up with a lot of these ideas a long time ago and a lot of them they're not working anymore and that's why we say that we're looking for those new ways of living because all you have to do is look around you and say because they're not working yes they're just not working and so come on let's let's use our imaginations i mean even in the bible in the old testament it talks about how we let us sit down and reason together well how do you reason you reason with the brain that you acknowledge God gave you. Well, then use that brain. Uh, I won't go into the analogy, but uh, the, the final line of, uh, of the analogy that I use is that uh, God basically says, you're not a puppet on a string being manipulated by forces you do not understand. Do something with the life I gave you. Yeah. Work yeah. together. Yeah. About 8 billion imagining people. But a lot of people have given up on that aspect of their lives. They've given up dreaming. And we want people to dream. Mm -hmm. That's how mm -hmm. we create. That's how we evolve. I know another dirty word uh, for some. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but mm -hmm. that's what your children do when they go to school. That's why yes. you send them to school is to evolve intellectually mentally, socially. Yeah, I know that the last year or so has been really rough. They haven't really been able to do, but we're starting to get back to that. And um, it just, it's, it boggles my mind sometimes how people, they tend to miss that. Don't miss Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World, as we continue talking with Tom Elsner. Tom Elsner, uh, a Jungian psychologist here in the Santa Barbara area. TomElsner.org is the website, and I'm Richard Dugan, your host. We're giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. And we're giving you all kinds of different ways to come up with those choices. That's another aspect, Tom. Tom Elsner uh, here in Santa Barbara, that um, if you don't start to uh, educate yourself, and it doesn't have to be formal education, okay? Um, be aware of the experiences you're having and learn from them, which is what education is all about. Then you begin to open up your mind to those new choices, don't you? I mean, that's, that's, that's the whole point of, of going to school is to decide whether you're going to go to college. Not everybody's suited for I went to junior college and then I went to a vocational school. I did, my sisters, my older sisters and younger sisters, uh, they went to university. My brother went to a technical school, DeVry, uh, mm -hmm. uh, way back when. And, uh, you know, we all chose our own paths and we've all been successful at what we do now. So talk to me about, um, talk to me about uh, this aspect of, um, of choices and education. And again, uh, I, that's a very, I'm using the word in its, in its broadest, broadest uh, uh, definition and context. Yeah, great. Well, I want to. I can't like drop what you said about imagination, which was okay. so great. I want to say one word about that, if I may, for a second. Is yeah, um, think about it. Imagination is the essence of humanity. It's the essence of what human beings are. It's the essence of all our values. Does life have worth? Is life sacred? Is that a fact? That's pure imagination. Should we rape and pillage and murder? Why not? It's wrong. That's pure imagination. If we didn't have imagination, we would lose our humanity completely. We would lose all our values. And in addition to that, what I want to pick up on another quality of imagination you mentioned earlier, which is the dualism of inner and outer. The British poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge had a phrase he called primary imagination that meant perception. Think about it. The world that you see, I'm looking at my window now, there's a tree out there, it's green, it's brown, it's, you know, in space and time. Green doesn't exist out there. Green, green is the product of electric magnetic radiation of a certain frequency hitting my eyeball, translated by my brain, you know, into boom, green. The world's soaked in imagination. It's the essence of the creation of the world we live in is imagination. And this is true in neurobiology now, as well as physics more and more. So 
just a, a shout out to what we call imagination that's been so devalued in the enlightenment tradition of Cartesian dualism as nothing but delusion or distortion of objective fact. Uh, no, it's the quintessence of reality of everything we can say, conceive of, perceive, anything we can touch, taste, smell is due to our soul, our imagination, our biology. So I want to just uh, rehabilitate that word even more than you did, um, if I can. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, there, education and choice. Yeah. Um, this is one of the great legacies of the European Enlightenment to me is education, choice, thinking for oneself. Immanuel Kant wrote an essay in the 18th century, what is enlightenment? And in the enlightenment is a complex cultural, political, social movement, but he summed it up in one phrase, sapere ade, in Latin that means dare to know, <laughs> dare to know. He meant by that dare to think for yourself. And the reason why he said people don't think for themselves isn't a lack of intelligence, but it's a lack of courage. Because if you start following your own imagination, your own thoughts, your own feeling, being true to yourself, you might end up in the eyes of other people, a heretic or a strange person or not doing what you should do. <laughs> you know, so he said it's an act of courage to do that. And the Royal Society, the, the, the long, most longstanding scientific society in the world that still exists, its motto is nullus in verba, take no one's word for it. So for me, those are great values. Like that's how I conceive of imagination. That's what I want for my children. That's how I've taught them since they were little. What do you feel? What do you think? What's your position? Here's what the left says. Here's what the right says. What do you say? What's your best truth? Be true to yourself and follow that. And that's education in the best sense, in my opinion that my son is at City College now taking philosophy courses and English lit courses. And I just tell him, look, this is what you're doing. You're learning to think for yourself. You know, and I'm going through, he's reading John Stuart Mill on ethics, you know, and we're going through it together. And he's, dad, thinking is hard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it is hard. It is hard. But it's so valuable to develop one's own standpoint. And it's not the god's own standpoint you know you we remain open of course to others as well but this is how i see it this is my best standpoint i have the capacity to convey that and be open to other people around me at the same time that's education oh my god if more people were educated the world would be totally different yeah yeah totally different Tom Elsner is my guest, and I'm Richard Dugan, and you're listening to Tell Me Your Story. New paradigms for a new world is what we're bringing you, and choices and knowledge of those choices. We're trying to educate you in the best way we know how. As I have said many times, Tom, uh, I, I'm a, a strong proponent of education. Um, I, I was actually going to close out uh, one of the segments here on the program with uh, this master's program with Tom Elsner has been brought to you in part by <laughs> a grant from this foundation, that foundation, and the other foundation, uh, like yeah. PBS or NPR or something, because that's how I feel sometimes with the guests that I have had on my program, as well as the many guests of the programs I've produced over the over 40 years that I have been doing this work. And I feel like there's got to be a way for me to uh, somehow convert all of that into, I don't know, a PhD or a master's degree or something. Of course, I'm not sure if there's a, a PhD or a master's degree in eclectic studies. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah. maybe I'll make yeah. it up. You know, hey, there's the yeah. Universal Life Church, of which I am a minister of. So uh, mm. maybe I'll start another website and uh, start cranking out PhDs for, for people uh, who are uh, of that uh, ilk, of eclectic studies. To me, that, that is, echo chambers are the last place that I want to go. Mm. Uh, mm. I don't like listening to the views of people who are spewing out i think the thing that bothers me more than anything else setting aside all of the uh, uh, uh doctrine and dogma and so forth opinion 
are the, is the name calling, is the putting down. And, and the, I have to say that I sit there at, uh, looking at the TV or listening to the radio going, how is that helping? Mm -hmm. the problems you say exist. And uh, I always put it back on them saying, look, you're blaming them for the problems, let's just say, of, of the state of California. You're blaming them. Ah, this is your fault. This is on you because you didn't get the people out that are of your ilk to vote for the people you wanted in there to make the decisions that you want them to make. Which, mm -hmm. by the way, isn't democracy at all. It's mob rule. Mm -hmm. If you mm -hmm. vote for somebody who's, not on, who's only going to do what you want them to, then they don't have a conscience. They don't have a say. Uh, they are now under threat of uh, getting tossed out at the next election because they didn't do what you wanted them to. You know, and yeah, they're supposed to be there and serve the constituents. I get that. Yeah. But isn't that yeah, why yeah. you hired them? Because they would represent your perspectives, your opinions, your values. Mm -hmm. So it's not on the people you're blaming. It's on you. Mm. Beautiful. Chico, I'll tell you what, I think one, and this, maybe this is another area to talk about here on the program as we continue talking with Tom Elsner here on Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I want to talk to you about that aspect of... Um, it's not about blame. It's about the message. Obviously, the message that you're putting out isn't resonating with people. You need to change your message. I'm not saying change your values. I'm not saying change your beliefs. I'm saying change the message. Make it more unifying. Mm. Make it more inclusive, if you will. I, I don't care much for that, you know, but there you are. Um, see, that's, that's my perspective, is there's nothing wrong with your viewpoint, but if you don't put it out there in such a way that is more palatable to those people who would not ordinarily listen to you because you're quote-unquote on the other side, then, you, you know, and, you know, they I, I always I thought this was really funny. The math just didn't add up as far as the, uh, for example, this recall election that we just had recently here in California for the governor. Right. This is a Democratic state. The population yeah. of this state is made up of more Democrats than Republicans. So what makes you think, because not all Democrats were opposed to this governor. They say, Let, nah, we'll, we'll put a new guy in there at the next election. We... And I was ticked because of $276 million wasted. Um, but uh, it's like, change your message. You know? mm -hmm. Think about what you really want to say. And words have power. But let's talk about that, that, that concept mm -hmm. of our message to others, whether it's a political or religious or otherwise, or just individuals. And you're having a conversation with somebody like you and I are having. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about uh, the importance of maybe fine-tuning our message. Mm. Great. R uh, when, you're, when you're speaking about this, of course, you're also speaking of yourself, right? And I can hear you've put a lot of work and a lot of time into developing a message. And obviously, you're super eloquent, super communicative, very open and very able to have dialogues with people. So I get, I hear you and everything you're saying, I hear you, the, what you've done. Uh, and I don't know you very well at all just through these interviews, but that's evident to me. So I just want to point that out too, before we get more abstract in a way about it. But this is a myth, like your myth, I can hear to return to that theme. <laughs> this is your myth loud and clear that you've lived and integrated and become and developed, you know, Quite, quite well, as far as I can tell. Um, but yeah, with um, in terms of the blaming you mentioned, so you can $10,000 of psychotherapy is, can just be summed up in this phrase. If you're pointing the figure at someone else, there's three pointing back at you. So if you get that, if you really, really get that in your bones, that is a, a huge step forward, uh, in my opinion. And um, the polit this is your, when your examples of politics, 
really bring up psychology examples that it's really what you're talking about in terms of political conflict and blame and et cetera. It's not politics in the sense of what's the best tax policy. Mm -hmm. Should we use deterrence in foreign policy or appeasement? It's not stuff like that. It's, it's, it's really psychology. And it's what Jung meant by shadow projection. Mm. So politics in this sense is a huge cauldron of complexes, wounds, shadow projections, you know, disengaging from one's own problematic sides of one's own personality and seeing them in other bad people out there and getting emotionally furious, right? So my dad, for instance, was a very conservative person. I mean, to the right of John Birch Society and yeah, such. And, wow. I mean, really, like, like no tolerance for anything beyond his point of view, zero. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you would mention to him, the, if you said this word to him, this name, Jane Fonda, oh. he would, his face would get red, his blood would boil. Do you know why? Traitor. Traitor. Uh, yeah. So this was the shadow side of his value system. Mm. Traitor, right? And it completely disowned as part of his shadow, like what doesn't correspond to his values. His own split was projected onto this woman he's never met, and he hated her, <laughs> right? That's no longer politics. That's pure psychology. And the only way we can understand that is through wounds, complexes, trauma, splitting, projection, psychological yeah. issues. You know, it's interesting uh, what flashed in my mind when you said that about Jane and your, your father. Uh, my first thought was, okay, so would you also say that those men and women who were part of the Confederacy were also traitors? And that's what I heard in a documentary not long ago when they were sort of dissecting the Civil War, that the South, the, again, a battle between the North and the South, our Civil War, uh, that they were, that the South, they were, they were in our modern day, they were a bunch of terrorists. They were homegrown yeah. terrorists. That's, that was the term that was used. And I, again, I go back to that. How is this helping name calling? You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah no right how is it helping i mean the, but this goes back to my dream of 9 11 yeah really you know and naively at this at the start of that dream i thought oh we're gonna have a reasonable discussion the afghan man the united states man. let's sit down and talk it out and have clear communication and we'll have understanding so naive give me a break give me a break the dream just laughs at that it's like the only chance you have is to start with yourself yeah. and integrate your own shadow it, it, otherwise it's, you're just a fool yeah tom elsner is my guest uh js for Jungian psychologist and we are talking about uh a lot of different subjects related to uh, where we've been where we are and where we're going as as a people whether it be californians uh, americans or if you will uh, uh global citizens uh, you know, uh, we're, we're talking about these concepts because they're very real to every one of us. And we hope that uh, you will continue listening to Tell Me Your Story. Uh, you can go to our uh, homepage, if you will, richarddugan.com or SoundCloud, where the channel for Tell Me Your Story is, or YouTube, where that channel is. And uh, uh, you can listen to and or watch and subscribe to the programs. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and uh, Tom Elsner is my guest, and we are talking here from a Jungian perspective. Uh, can you sum up the Jungian perspective in, you know, one or two, I was going to say one or two words. That's not possible. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that people can get an idea, sort of a, 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 a compare and contrast, I don't know, let's say uh, with Freud or Socrates or any of the other great philosophers, I guess you might say, um, uh, down through our history. Well, great, yes. Yeah. So Socrates, amazing person, completely rational, um, completely rational. His ideal was rational. Freud, not so much. Freud <laughs> discovered this, <laughs> the buckets of the absolutely non-rational 
repressed dimensions of the Western psyche for him, sexuality and aggression, you know? So one of his books in the thirties was civilization and its discontents. Civilization is our greatest asset, our greatest accomplishment. It prevents us from rapes and murders and all sorts of horrors. And at the same time, it's our worst enemy because it splits us into, and it causes us to repress big chunks of ourselves. Again, for him, mostly sexuality and aggression that make us quote unquote neurotic. The neurotic person in Freud's language was split between conscious and unconscious because of civilization. Now Jung was building on Freud. He was uh, one of Freud's students and he, he uh, built on Freud's idea of the unconscious as a vast, vast matrix of the human psyche that goes far beyond the personal, our personal memories, what's been repressed in our childhood and opens up onto the archetype, what he called the archetypal dimension of the psyche, um, what makes us quintessentially human. Um, and there's transpersonal dimensions, not just personal dimensions to the human psyche. That was Jung's contribution, archetypes of the collective unconscious. So the Jungian, um, the Jungian point of view is basically summed up with the goal of self-knowledge but understood not just as a rational philosophical endeavor, but as a real confrontation with our own unconscious in the name of wholeness, a new myth, right? Not good versus evil, not inner versus outer, but wholeness, completeness, all of it, all that lives is holy, as Blake said. And that's a big challenge. It starts with the shadow. It starts with dimensions of ourselves that make us uncomfortable, that we disown. And really the confrontation with those is the beginning of the Jungian analytical work. Would you say that uh, for an individual to feel as though they are making progress uh, as far as, I like to use the term like you know, raising one's consciousness, okay? Uh, getting to know oneself, both the light and the shadow side. Uh, the, the, the one sign might just be feeling uncomfortable. Not all the time, mm. <laughs> but... yeah. You, okay, uh, I, I, I really don't want to go down this road, but I know that it will really help. So I'm going to, okay, I'm going to dive in and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get through this particular thing. And it's really, I'm stepping outside my comfort zone. Beautifully said. Yeah. Yeah. The metaphor for me with that is always stop running from myself. Just stop running from yourself. It's impossible to run from yourself. So stop, turn around and face the things you've never wanted to face. And you see that image a lot in people's dreams and analysis, by the way, exactly. I'm being chased by a monster, <laughs> stop and turn around, face the monster, and something unexpected happens, often quite good. This is Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, and I certainly hope that uh, you're enjoying this program. And if you are, it resonates with you, you like the guests we're bringing, and you'd like to support us financially, we would greatly appreciate that. Uh, you can go to PayPal, and when you go to PayPal and you want to send, then put in my email address, richard at richarddugan.com. Send me an email too, richard at richarddugan.com. Uh, we'd love to hear from you, your ideas, your thoughts, uh, you know, even uh, concerns that you have over maybe some of the things that have been said on this program. I never put anything on anybody that I say about myself. It's all mine, okay? So please don't take it on. I'm not putting it on anybody else. Uh, what I am putting out is this program, both uh, in live uh, stream uh, as well as <clears throat> podcasts and video casts. This is Tell Me Your Story, and Tom Elsner is my guest, and we are. Um, fast approaching the end of our program here and our time together and uh, we will have you back again to talk more not just about the areas that we've discussed but others as well as we continue to move forward as a society as a civilization through the COVID era we will eventually get to the end of it and start a new era don't know what it'll be called but the opportunities are out there folks and um, Tom I want to thank you so much for giving us uh, this time and conversing with us on these subjects and uh, hopefully we have we have opened a few eyes anyway even if it's just a little uh, to at least the possibilities mm. thank you richard it's a pleasure to talk with you really you make it fun great questions love what you're doing thank you it's a pleasure i uh, do want to ask you those three final questions i know i asked you of the uh, asked you <laughs> 
the last time we were here. However, right. sometimes the answers change, okay? <laughs> uh, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see what pops out now. Who knows? Hey, yeah. you know, that's the beauty of ad lib. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's no script. Um, but before I do that, I just want to remind you, uh, the listener, uh, that uh, we are here uh, Sundays at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday mornings at 1 a.m. and 9 a.m. on Wednesdays for our special edition of Tell Me Your Story. And, of course, the podcasts on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, and many other locations, as well as the video cast on YouTube, the channel Richard Dugan and Tell Me Your Story. Hope that you will uh, subscribe to those. And, of course, as I mentioned earlier, if you'd like to support the work that we're doing, PayPal is the way to do it. And just put in my email address, richard at richarddugan.com. And also spend time. We didn't really get into this, but I think it's important. Maybe we'll uh, bring this up in our next program with Tom about our intuition, listening to that still small voice. Please participate in the decade of perfect vision, the 2020. Spend that time going within. You don't have to deal with the shadow side. Just go in there and maybe let this dust settle for a few minutes. Uh, one of my guests said, start with 60 seconds. Just start with 60 seconds. You don't have to do five hours and sit in the lotus posture. Just sit in your chair for 60 seconds. Close your eyes, not if you're driving, and uh, just relax. Just maybe imagine a, a, a beautiful green forest or meadow or whatever your favorite happy place is, if you will, uh, and just relax. So please participate in that with us, if you wouldn't mind. Tom, we are going to wrap things up by these three questions. And the first of those three is, who is Tom Elsner? <laughs> well, I remember from last time, I don't think my answers changed much. It just evoked a mystery in me when you say that. Who knows? Oh, my God. <laughs> what is it that you yeah. hope to or want to achieve through the work that you're doing now? Oh, uh, the, the most powerful moments I have in the work that I'm doing, especially recently, uh, is, is, is um, allowing people to be themselves in all the ways that they never felt comfortable through shame or guilt. And seeing the healing that comes from that, the wholeness that opens up through that, and the transformations that come from that. It's really through listening deeply to people. Mm. Finally, what is, uh, uh, what is your life's purpose? <laughs> Again, it's a, I love the question. It evokes a mystery like the first question to me. There is a mystery there, an enigma, something difficult to understand, but something real. Well, Tom, I thank you so much once again for joining us here on the program. I do look forward to having you back again. And I think maybe, uh, I don't know how uh, Young uh, looks at uh, our intuition or still small voice. And I've had the uh, comments made, well, yeah, how can you be sure that that still small voice is the one you want to listen to? Maybe you've got several in there. We'll maybe dive into that a little bit the next time. That sounds great. Um, sounds great. Yeah. Well, Tom Elsner has been my guest, TomElsner.com, we will be, uh, .org, that's TomElsner.org, we will be linked to his website, and I hope that you will uh, check out Tom, he is here in the Santa Barbara area, and um, uh, available if you're here locally, or I'm sure uh, nationally or internationally for that matter, uh, via Zoom or other uh, uh, video chat method. I thank you for listening and watching Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World, as we give you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. Until our next broadcast, podcast, videocast, love to lull.